So maybe maybe let's start with uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a bit uh, uh, about the history of the project, how 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 you came to this, to how what was the idea, the initial idea? Yeah. So um, by coincidence or luck uh, uh, for the termination. I, I already had uh, uh, lives, two lives, you know, one in the science technology. I studied mathematics, uh, actually my thesis was in physics. And then I started working in software. I worked on the internet before it was called the internet. I worked in artificial intelligence in 1983, uh, 40 years ago. Um, so there was one life. And then the other life, uh, you know, I like music, cinema, art uh, like many kids and I started writing about it I started meeting the people who do it and uh, so that so I had the two social networks basically and I was trying to put them together with uh, events that were not formal um, were very casual um, and is you know at one point um, we decided to democratize you know, it used to be just uh, uh, very intelligent people get together and tell each other how smart they are, <clears throat> and uh, and then we decided uh, let's let's uh, open it to everybody. And so January two thousand eight is the first time that we used uh, the term uh, uh, laser. Uh, so why I say we and not just uh, I, uh, because it was an effort with uh, Roger Malina. <clears throat> and with uh, Leonardo, so some people decided mm, this is interesting enough. Let's uh, let's make it let's make it a periodical um, <clears throat> uh, event, and let's publicize it on a network that is bigger than just uh, Piero's friends. But for a while, but, uh, for a while, it was just uh, Piero's hobby uh, because I was the main person doing it, and uh, uh, it was mainly my network. Uh, they started in San Francisco. <clears throat> and then the second venue was in Silicon Valley and, and eventually moved to Stanford. And I think moving to Stanford and then to Berkeley a few months later really uh, gave the momentum, right? The, the curve went uh, exponential, uh, both in terms of prestige and in terms of um, um, fame of, you know, people talk mm -hmm. about it. Now that's, uh, and then, then you know, more, more initially was people who knew me, who started it. Uh, so it was friends of mine who started saying, well, I'll do one at UC Davis, I'll do one in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and then Leonardo uh, took it more seriously. Leonardo started spreading the news really uh, worldwide and so on. Now th that's, uh, <clears throat> that uh, when I tell this story, it really, uh, simplifies too much the discussion. Um, <clears throat> so uh, some years ago in 2010, about 2010, I started writing a book um, on the history of Silicon Valley. Um, a friend of mine uh, was telling me, why don't we write a book on, uh, on uh, Silicon Valley? He knew that I had written cultural histories of uh, things like rock music. And he asked me, why don't you write one a cultural history of Silicon Valley? Uh, so initially I thought it was a stupid idea. And then when I started thinking about it, you know, I was working all, also um, on wh why Athens in Greece, why Florence in Italy, why Paris at the turn of the 20th century. There, were, there are all these places that are so unlikely to be influential and then suddenly they become extremely influential, you know, the boom of creativity, right? And very unlikely places. And then I started thinking, which is the place today that was so unlikely and then became a boom of creativity. And then I realized that that's, that's here, that's the San Francisco Bay Area. If you go back to 1950, if, if you lived in 1950 and I ask you, uh, tell me which will be the next great place of creativity in the world. You would never mention the San Francisco Bay Area. 
It was a place for crazy artists, period. There was no technology, no science, no Nobel Prize winners, no big electronic companies. Nothing would tell you this is the place that we rule the world. Fast forward to 2020, number one search engine, Google, is here. Number one social network, Facebook, is here. Number one semiconductor, Intel, is here. Oracle is here. Zoom is here. Apple is here. Uh, Airbnb, Uber. How did this happen? You know, how did this happen? So I decided writing the book is, uh, is uh, important to tell people how it happened. If you only consider technology, money, and science, you will never explain it, never. And uh, the point is, it was the creativity. Yes, it was a place for crazy artists and crazy musicians, crazy politicians, crazy everybody. But the craziness is precisely what made it different. Then the technology came just because of the Cold War, actually. You guys, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Russia, <clears throat> for causing the United States to move technology <clears throat> to the West Coast. Well, initially World War II, but then the Cold War was, was the big thing for the internet, right? For the for computers. And the technology came for military purposes. And the crazy people here totally hijacked it. They, they, they took the internet and they turned it into a social media in, in a, a way to communicate. The first time I used the internet when I came to California uh, was uh, as, as, a, <clears throat> as a news feed for uh, rock music. You know, people here were using it for all sorts of organizing parties, you know. Um, so that's important to understand. The S Silicon Valley would not exist without this pre-existing creativity in the arts, in music, in literature, in, in, in politics, in philosophy. Um, they were not the greatest. They were not the greatest artists, the greatest philosophers, but they were crazy, you know? You know, at one point, I, I don't particularly like Steve Jobs, but at one point he said it right when he said, think different. That's what they did here. There was the job here. The job here was think different. That technology comes and people start thinking different about technology. Uh, one favorite example, when in 1970, in a place called Zero's Park, uh, a group of young people with long hair, you know, like hippies, decided we want to build a computer that sits on a desk. Do you know how stupid that idea was in 1970? A computer in 1970 was as big as my house, was bigger than your apartment in St. Petersburg. And they decided, I want a computer on a desk. And you know why? For children in schools. That was such a crazy idea. Well, guess what? A few years later, somebody named Steve Jobs saw the idea and thought, huh, this is the future, this is the future of computers. So <clears throat> that's the secret. And it's always been, you know. When, when, uh, when they started the, the, the World Wide Web uh, in Europe, it was a scientific experiment. When it came here, they started thinking, hmm, let me put it on everybody's computer and see what happens. So, so the lasers have a bigger uh, ideology behind them that I realized only later, that it really uh, the lasers fit very well with the spirit of Silicon Valley. And all the movies and TV shows that you see, they usually miss this part. They show you the crazy kid starting a company, but why does it have to be here? Why the crazy kid that doesn't start a company in New York uh, or, or in the Midwest uh, uh, in, or, or, or in, uh, in Los Angeles, which is nearby? Why does it have to be Silicon Valley? So they miss the point that once you come here, you are under the influence uh, of this uh, addictive mindset. You have to think different. That's why you started here. That's why the crazy kid on your TV show is based here. So that was missing. And the lasers are just one of the many things that have been going on here that mix art, science, and technology. I just gave them the academic name. Leonardo, Art Science Evening Rendezvous. That was the only thing I did. But the interrelation of art and science and technology 
and, and politics and philosophy and history was already here. In fact, it is the very spirit of Silicon Valley. And I call it the well-kept secret of Silicon Valley. Of course, today Silicon Valley is the old San Francisco Bay Area, it's not just the South Bay. So the, there's a bigger uh, ideology behind the lasers that, uh, that it's a little hard to explain. <clears throat> uh, by the way, the Chinese, of all people, the Chinese got very interested in this story. Uh, when my book came out, um, it was meant just as a, a you know, hobby project for me and my friend Arun. And then somebody from China wrote and said, do you mind if I translate it into Chinese? Of course, we were so honored. We gave the rights for free, you know? And then I started being invited by the Chinese to speak in China. And I realized that the Chinese were the ones who took Silicon Valley very seriously. Basically, they kept asking me, how did you guys made it? They realized the similarity that the San Francisco Bay Area had nothing and created the number one place in the world for you know, creativity and so on. And China was similar. After the Cultural Revolution, culture had nothing, and it was trying to build the Silicon Valley, in fact, many Silicon Valleys. So they took it very seriously. And of course, it's very difficult to explain to the Chinese that what you need is crazy scientists working with crazy artists and crazy uh, politicians and so on. Uh, but they had the same question, how did you guys made it? And I think in Europe, people take it, um, as, take it as granted, well, it happened there, but why did it happen there? I don't think enough Europeans focus on answering the question, why did it happen there? All right, so th that's a long story. Uh, the other story that is missing, if I only uh, tell you the chronology of events, is that uh, uh, introducing the audience was important as a mission for the lasers. See, originally it was more focused on the people, on the Leonardos, on the people who are trying to be Leonardo, the people who are trying to be uh, active in the fields that normally are very different, right? Then when we brought in the audience, uh, it became really a mission to, uh, to break boundaries. Um, you know, the, I, uh, in, 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 a, in a typical laser, you hear a scientist, an engineer, an artist, a musician, a historian. When people come, the people who come to the talk, very often they come to, to listen to just one of them. You know, they come to listen to the scientist. I force them to listen to the artist, to the musician and so on. And the biggest compliment for me is when they walk out and they tell me, Piero, I had no idea. You know what that means? It means they never saw a painting in their life other than the one time they went to the Louvre. But this time they had a, a, a media artist telling them this is what I'm doing and they were fascinated. So that became really a goal of the laser, you know, to quote unquote, force the, uh, the audience to listen to somebody who is in a different field, to really promote this idea that you shouldn't spend your life only in your specialization. And even the speakers sometimes tell me this, you know, the physicists who come to talk about quantum uh, uh, gravity and he spend, spends all his day talking with people about quantum gravity, I force him to listen to the musician before him and, and the artist after him. And when he walks out, he's happy. He, he had a day that was different from the usual day. And he realized, oh my God, there's a lot more on this planet. Yes, thank you. You've you've mentioned uh, you've mentioned that one of the goal of um, uh, of these activities was to create to write a sort of cultural history of Silicon Valley, and I think it's quite a difficult task because uh, it's not only about the history of technology; it, it's about the history of a uh, huge amount of social relations. So, do you think so? Uh, do you think it's so, so the question is maybe um, how these difficult uh, relations we can present to very different audiences and um, without simplifying the, you know, the, his the history the, uh, and all these 
processes that mm, this cultural history involves in, or includes? That's a good question. It's a difficult question. Um, I think, so first of all, uh, I, now I call myself a cultural historian because mm -hmm. I realized even before writing the book on Silicon Valley, I wrote a book on, on uh, rock music that it's, it's actually been, I think still is my most successful book. And why I wrote a book on, a, on, a, on rock music? Well, number one, because I like rock music, but I also realized <clears throat> that there was no explanation for why these things uh, started happening in the 50s, you know, the, the, the young people uh, becoming rebels and, 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 uh, and wanted to talk about uh, sex and then drugs and uh, uh, sometimes violence and then becoming punks that talk about uh, really filthy uh, things and so on. And there's no real uh, simple story about that. You know, cinema is a little easier. There's a technology, then you start using it. And then of course there are great uh, filmmakers who make great movies. But with rock music it's different because the, the music industry didn't like it. And, it's, and, and especially that the... So to explain phenomena like this, you need to study the culture, you need to study the society. It's not enough to just try to use uh, uh, economics, uh, politics. You can study all the president of the United States, you will not explain rock music, and you will not explain Silicon Valley. You know, this is, there's no president who said, let's create a Silicon Valley. Um, <clears throat> so you have to study the culture, the whole culture of an area. And, and uh, then I realized that that's precisely what I was trying to do with Athens and Florence and, uh, and so on. You don't explain, uh, see, see that the history of Greek civilization usually starts with a zero one, there's nothing, and then suddenly there is a, there, there is a Greek philosophy. Where did it come from? You know, why, why there? I mean, it's, if you lived in Egypt, now I'll tell you the same thing, you know, you live in Egypt in uh, 1000 BC and somebody asks you, where's the next big uh, boom of civilization? I mean, do you think, I mean, Greece was, was a, a, a barren, uh, uh, poor peninsula uh, far away, uh, from the point of view of the Egyptians, they were probably barbarians, you know? So why Athens? Why, why, why Greece? And same with Florence. I mean, I mean, if you lived in, a, in, a, in Paris in, a, in, in 1200, and somebody asked you, you will never pick Italy. Italy was a big mess, it was fragmented in hundreds of city-states fighting each other, it was invaded uh, from the south, from the north. Uh, so why Italy? Why the Renaissance starts in Italy? So you don't explain these things unless you really study the society there. And if you study society there, you find out that the most uh, literate city in the world was Florence. Why? Because they were traders. They needed to read and write and they needed to do arithmetic. Very simple reason. But Florence was the first city that made it mandatory for children to study. It was important for trade, for commerce, okay? And who knows? Maybe that was very important and some other things. I mean, but if you put together the whole society, then sometimes you see that that society, that society is creating elements that will be very important, more important than wars and kings and armies to explain what happens next, okay? So my general advice to everybody is to study the society and the culture of your region and write a history based on that thing. And, and this is true, by the way, for everybody. I mean, that this is not only for the great centers of creativity, but you can pick any place in the world and uh, you can write a cultural history uh, of, uh, of that place. Uh, now I'm trying to remember my favorite uh, book that on the history of Russia is called Natasha's Dance. And I can't remember the, the name of the author. But if you read Natasha's dance, you do get a feeling of uh, a different feeling of the history of Russia because it focuses on the culture, not just, yes, of course, it tells you about the, the emperor and, uh, and uh, what Katerina did and what, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, but it also focuses on why suddenly Russia has, has Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. In one century, Russia is, is some of the greatest writers in the history of the world. Where did it come from? You know, it's a similar question, right? 
So you can do the same exercise uh, for every region in the world. And especially when you have a boom of creativity, you should ask yourself, where did it come from? You know, out of nowhere? And it has an impact on the real history. I don't want people to think it's, it's only about the, the culture. Uh, when when uh, uh, Prussia, uh, Germany, right? Prussia invented the, the PhD. Uh, I mean, those were barbarians. But, I mean, Prussia was created by the medieval knights. Uh, they had no major tradition, uh, no major influence, uh, military influence. But then one day they invented the PhD. Uh, education becomes very important in that, in that kingdom. And guess what? In 1870, they win a war against France, which was the, the world power. Uh, the history of the world changed. And then, and then, then the same region became the, the, the center of electrification, the first uh, country to massively elect, el electrify. And that turned Germany into, into world power. And still today, Germany is the, what is it, number three, number four economy in the world. So these things have, have uh, cultural aspects of a society have uh, a huge influence on, on, the, on, the, on the history of a nation. You know? so, now that's, so this is very complicated and it's complicated because historians traditionally don't do this. Historians are very good at studying what a king, what a general uh, did, and that's important. I'm not saying no. Um, unfortunately, a lot of events recently have been uh, determined by Donald Trump in this country. I cannot deny that. Uh, but the society is also a very, very important component in understanding all of this. So this goes way beyond the lasers. You know, the, the, the lasers are a, are a teeny aspect of what we should do when we study uh, society. And also uh, when we try to influence the future, I'm talking about the past so far, but indirectly, as I'm saying, I'm also trying to influence the future. Um, by the way, <clears throat> uh, recently the United States woke up to the fact that uh, radicalization, extremism, terrorism uh, are also uh, problems here. Uh, I used these words, uh, radicalization, extremism, terrorism, until, until January 5, January 5th, we thought, oh, this is Islam, right? <laughs> you think about radicalization, you think of Muslims. And on January 6th, uh, the United States woke up to realize uh, radicalization now has different meanings. It's not just uh, a problem in that part of the world that there's a lot of wars and dictators. It's also a problem here. Well, I would like um, a smarter people than me to discuss the relationship between specialization, you know, this society of specialists that we created uh, and radicalization. Um, uh, we have created a society where if you are uh, a doctor, you, only, you should only worry about medicine. If you are a physicist, you should only talk with physicists. If you are an artist, you should only talk with artists, art galleries, museum. Well, it, it would be interesting to analyze, uh, is that one of the reasons why we create radicalization, uh, that people tend to be so narrowly focused on their field that it, it has become harder to communicate with the people who have a different background. So somebody smarter than me should have uh, this discussion. Yes, thank, uh, thank you. So, um, um, it's a very interesting question that you that you speak right now. Is just to how to it's about how to overcome these divisions that are created by contemporary culture of specialization, and uh, um, uh, talking about different places that um, uh, uh, that laser talks occupy. Um, what's the difference, for example, between lasers in San Francisco uh, and the difference, for example, uh, the lasers in Florence, because it's the city with very deep classical culture, where 
classical, I don't know, um, you know, wonderful museums, history. It's like in St. Petersburg, it's quite, it's quite difficult to introduce media art here because the academy the, um, and this classical art history is still very powerful. And the, class and the classical art history is also based on this specialization. There are genres that considered to be art and there are a lot of things that are that is not considered to be art. And for example, for us, it took more than 10 years in order to make media art accessible for first for professional audience, because we, we were not allowed to use quite a lot of spaces in the city because they, were, they, they didn't understand what, what, what you're doing here with all these devices, with all this technological discourse. So, um, uh maybe uh so my question is how um yes first maybe what's the difference when you when you have san francisco which is one city and florence with a with a cultural city and how to how we can overcome this specialization for example via um, via this virtual dialogues or, or right now, or like real dialogues as before. So, so uh, uh, first of all, <clears throat> it's not only the difference between uh, um, between countries, but just think of the Bay Area. There's a difference between the lasers in San Francisco, the lasers in Stanford, and the lasers in Berkeley. I noticed them because I I, I co-chair all. Uh, all three series. Um, so just in very small territory, you can have uh, differences in the way people react to them. Um, I think at some point, uh, the lasers will become very useful um, to study these differences. I think it's too early um, to have this discussion. I know too little about what happens outside the Bay Area. <clears throat> but as I said, even within the Bay Area, I could already have a discussion. Uh, it's a discussion that I think it requires people to understand the culture, you know, why, why, what is different between Berkeley and Stanford, uh, two big universities, but they're completely different histories and a very different uh, kind of uh, faculty. Um, so the, I think the lasers, I, I don't have an answer to your question, but I think that the lasers will become interesting. At some point, somebody will try to put together our experiences and compare them and, and, uh, and draw some conclusions. I think in all of the places where they exist, uh, we have the same problem. We have different solutions, and that's very fascinating, but we have the same problem, specialization. People are so uh, take it for granted. You know, I always tell people, uh, young people, when they ask you, as a child, what would you like to be when you grow up? Don't answer the question. It's a trick question. Because once you say, I want to be an astronaut, you will become an astronaut. And you will spend your life being only that. Okay? You shouldn't pick one. You should say, I want to be a human being. I want to be a smart person. Uh, I want to know as much as possible. You know, to, Something different, something that doesn't force you to be just one thing and young people usually are not one thing you know it's a, I, I, I met great uh, guitar players who then gave up the guitar because they became facebook engineers you know, that's a pity um, so i think we have we share the problem um, but the solutions will be different uh, because because different places have different uh, um, in different cultures. I, I think at some point it will be interesting, interesting to compare and, and, see, um, and see what solutions we came up with. In a sense, a laser is a little experiment at seeing if we can uh, break some of these, uh, of these barriers. Um, it's, it's also interesting, uh, you mentioned Florence. Well, Florence doesn't have uh, a laser series. In fact, there's no laser series in Italy. And uh, that's also interesting. So it could just be that by accident, we haven't met the right people, or it could be that places with uh, strong uh, cultural traditions um, 
have uh, are more reluctant. It's more difficult in those places uh, to have this kind of discussion. So, uh, so again, this this is too soon, in my opinion, to really make big statements. Um, so I'm not answering your question, but I'm saying the lasers could provide interesting uh, material for maybe even anthropologists uh, to study this, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, our contribution to breaking barriers is very limited. We don't have uh, the money, we don't have the reach, we don't have the political influence to really change anything, even, even the way uh, children study in elementary school. So our, our power is very limited. But as an experiment, it could be really interesting for um, for somebody to analyze and see and see what uh, what we did. Yes, thank you. And maybe my next question will be uh, about the difference between uh, maybe academic education and arts education that, for example, that is organized by uh, such associate associations and, uh, um, like Leonardo. Uh, what's, what's the difference between education, I don't know, media art education right now in the universities? And what's the, uh, and uh, why it's important to organize uh, events and discussions uh, outside of contemporary universities. Is it also to break uh, the specialization or, um, or, or there is something, something else? So, and maybe what, uh, what can we borrow from uh, academic education in order to promote media art in a different way? And what we can borrow from, um, let's say, unofficial education? So. So first of all, <clears throat> Um, again, each university is different. Um, if, I, if, I, if I focus, to answer your question, if I focus on Stanford, I, I, I picture a different situation than if I focus on, uh, uh, for example, San Jose State University uh, or MIT. You know, San Jose State University has a, a laboratory called Cadre. It's been around for a long time and uh, they focus on, uh, on new media. Uh, Stanford doesn't really have that. <clears throat> and the art department tends to be more about uh, Italian Renaissance, okay? So, and <clears throat> so even, you know, without each specialization, you have specialization or specializations and so on. Uh, so I think it, it, uh, the discussion about uh, art education really depends, really depends a lot. Um, in general, of course, it's not only universities. Universities, museums, galleries, uh, they all create uh, a view of art that then they try to promote uh, indirectly. So I think that the discussion is much more, uh, much broader. Um, I, 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 I don't have the numbers, but I wonder how many of the great artists got a formal education, an academic ed education before they became great artists. So sometimes I see the, uh, the academic teaching of art <clears throat> as creating great art historians, great art critics, but not necessarily great artists, period. Um, I think uh, a lot of great artists starting the old centuries, they learned from other artists, period. They learned by being part of a community of artists. Uh, that's true in uh, Montmartre, Paris, a century ago. It's true certainly in the Renaissance. Um, so there's always been an element uh, of practice where art, art practice is, uh, at the end of the day, what really matters. Uh, a lot of artists are inspired by what happens uh, in their neighborhood. Uh, 
sometimes I compare them to social workers because they are the ones who really understand uh, the social issues of their neighborhood. What has that got to do with the uh, academic uh, teaching of art? Uh, so um, it's an interesting uh, discussion in general, uh, how art happens. You have academia, which has makes uh, interesting discussion. To me, academia tries to understand art, uh, not necessarily to create the next great artist. And then you have the art museum that tries to, uh, to have the definition of art. This is art, okay? Once you take that toilet and you put it in a museum, it is art. You take these glasses, you put them in a museum, they become art. Then you have art galleries that try to sell art. You know, unfortunately, without money, artists die. <clears throat> but then you have the studio where the art actually happens, or sometimes the sidewalk, sometimes it's public art, sometimes it's, uh, it's in the woods. So that's an interesting discussion, how these things interact. Uh, as I said, I tend to see academia more the place where art is understood analyzed, not necessarily where a great artist is created. And on the other hand, in, a, in some garage, uh, maybe it's where a great art is created. New media, but this is true also in the past, but anyway, new media are expensive, as you were saying. Um, new media are expensive, so you have an issue that how can an artist emerge if, it, if it, she or he doesn't have the money to buy the, 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 the tools. Uh, but again, I think this was true also in the past and that's where you have a community of, of artists trying to share things, right? Um, it would be nice if we could also provide the interaction between artists and engineers, meaning in general, the, the the, the world of technology that makes it easier to do this. And so I'm always happy when I hear that uh, Facebook or Google or Intel as an artist in residence program. I think those things are important. Um, maybe the artist doesn't get a lot of inspiration, but he gets access to, to tools, to devices. And by the way, that when we talk about media art, uh, I'm always a little reluctant with art and technology. I'm always a little uh, unhappy with that uh, uh, definition because art has always used technology. Even a poet uses a pen and a piece of paper. Well, that's technology. Uh, so art always uses technology. When people say art and tech, they're saying art. Um, and when you say new media art, then you, it better be really new. Uh, around here, there's a lot of people are using deep learning to make art, virtual reality to make art. That's not new. There's an, you know, any, any high school kid is doing the same thing. Um, so that's, uh, that's also interesting that the, I think the great artist doesn't necessarily uses the latest uh, technology, uh, but uh, he uses it in a way that is completely new. It's the way it is new. It's not the media that is new. Yes, thank you. Um, very simple question. Do you do you have your favorite laser? Maybe there were some interesting discussions, or I don't know. Maybe you have uh, I don't know something. Uh, talking about interactions between um, the person who between scientists artists and the audience maybe you can remember um, uh, lasers when this interaction was really interesting or something really interesting happened during the lecture or that's an interesting question I, uh, it's an interesting question because if i think <clears throat> Or favorite moments during uh, the laser series, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the audience. 
um, I, not uh, it's uh, that's interesting. It's my interaction with the audience. It's, it's when the audience um, tells me, or somebody in the audience tells me something or wants to do something. So the audience probably is more important than I realized uh, rationally. Um, <clears throat> honestly, the the lasers. Um, for me are so intense that probably I don't have time to, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't remember specific moments. Uh, out of the lasers, I created a festival called the Last Festival, Life, Art, Science, Technology Festival. So if you ask me the same question about the last festival, then I have answers. I guess because, so the last festival was born as a, greatest hits of the lasers and also as an opportunity for the artist to actually exhibit uh, most of the art is interactive um, at the last festival and so that's that is the place where the artist can actually you know show it demonstrate not just uh, have a powerpoint but actually it's there physically there and the people can play with it and usually we get an entire building. It's like a playground. People can play with the art. At the same time, the scientists, uh, some of my favorite scientists are giving talks. So if you ask me the same question about the last festival, then I have a lot of funny uh, moments that I remember. I guess because it's more like a party. You know this, right? A festival is always a different feeling. And you meet so many interesting people and uh, I remember the, the famous uh, scientist, the director of a major research center who came to look at the, at the art and uh, uh, there were children. Children are always the first ones to start playing with interactive installations. And he got upset that the children couldn't, didn't let him play. So he was like competing with the children to have access uh, to these uh, art installations. And of course, as a scientist, he was trying to figure out what's behind this, right? How does it work? Does it say he sends a packet to the internet and then da, 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 da. So I have, uh, I have moments of the last festival that I remember um, more emotionally. <clears throat> um, yeah, unfortunately, the last festival, just like uh, uh, everywhere else in the world uh, is on hold because of the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and that's another interesting discussion. I mean, how do you move these things online? Is the laser online the same as the laser, as the physical laser? Uh, all these festivals that are moving online, are they the same? Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about this. Mm. Yes, I think it's interesting uh, what will happen in the future because uh, on one hand, so technology, uh, um, the previous year, with the COVID-19 technology became very, very important. But at the same time, I feel that many people, they feel um, they're very tired of being always being online, always using Zoom or Skype. And uh, do you think this format will leave or uh, there will be, or will, or, or, or all these kind of things, they will stop uh, after the pandemic? So what will happen? No, so, so all, all this, uh crisis are always uh, uh, are, are always influential they always leave something behind uh, you can think of uh, not only pandemics uh, but uh, wars um, crisis of all sudden economic crisis they always change the world that, that is, uh, and by the way they often create new artistic movements think when, when Dada was born Probably Dada to me is one of the most influential movements ever. When 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 was it war? I mean, it was born in the middle of uh, World War One, uh, which was a massive carnage, and uh, then it, it uh, blossomed uh, in the middle of the of the Spanish flu, right? So, uh, so we have precedents that uh, things stick around. I think a lot of what we are doing online. Uh, was already possible. Uh, it just uh, um, it just uh, it takes a while. It takes something has to force us to use uh, technology actually. And sometimes it's just the marketing of a company. 
sometimes it's it's a pandemic. So uh, all of these tools were available and we were not using them uh, just because it takes time to accept it, you know? <clears throat> it's like when cinema at the beginning was just uh, showing uh, a theater and it took a while for them to realize you can have a two hour, three hour movie that could never be done in a theater. You know, so, so it takes uh, it takes some time. Now that we are online, some things will, will remain. I mean, think of the, my, my online lasers. First of all, I've had many more uh, than physical lasers uh, in one year. And then I've had speakers from uh, all over the world, from Europe, China. Uh, I will have one from New Zealand very soon, East Coast. Uh, you know, in the past, it was difficult, uh, impossible. You need money to fly people around. Even locally, I noticed it's easier to get a, a, a speaker. There are some speakers who don't want to drive from Berkeley to Stanford. You know, it's a one hour drive, then you have to park. Um, but if you do it on Zoom, they do it. So some things will remain. I think my online lasers will remain. I will continue doing them. And especially uh, the audience gets used to it. You know, in the past, it would be difficult to tell the audience there's something online, listen to it. But now it's become so normal. You know, people talk to their children, parents uh, on Zoom. Um, what uh, the limitations, some of the limitations are obvious. You know, it's not the same thing. Uh, you know, the, like the QA in, in a room, uh, in a Stanford room, you have audience sometimes standing up, sometimes somebody sitting on the front. The speaker is right there and you can interact. And when there's a break, sometimes uh, it's difficult to restart because if they started chatting, okay, where's that? Uh, that, that doesn't exist on, on, uh, on, online. And then there's, there's uh, things also, you know, why we get tired. Honestly, I get tired of seeing my face. You know, I see my face all the time and it's only the front. It's not like this, I cannot talk like this. You know, but, but in a room, I'm moving around, I'm walking. I'm moving, you know, and you see my face here. And sometimes I turn to, to, to write something, okay? I don't know if this is, a, this is my artist genes that speak now, but it's horrible to see people only the front, only the front, everybody's looking at me, okay? I see you guys, I say, hey, why can't you move around, you know? So there are obvious limitations that have to do with the body. With the, uh, with the physical movement. And maybe somebody will invent uh, a better kind of Zoom that gives you more the feeling of the real room. Uh, it will still always be difficult to replace the physical interaction. Uh, you know, somebody was telling me, I want to smell the sweat of the speaker as I'm asking the question, you know? Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of things will remain. I think uh, there's been a, a decisive move online uh, and pervasive. I mean, it's, uh, the, we are surrounded here by friends who work from home. My wife works from home. I'm now speaking from a room that used to be a guest room. Now it's my studio because my, my wife needs to use the bigger room. Um, so that that will not change that. And, and that creates a whole new economy. Um, <clears throat> which, you know, the moment I say the word economy, people think bad things, but economies is what young, is the jobs of young people. So every young person right now doesn't need me to tell him or tell her, start thinking about what, what job will you have in this new economy? Uh, and luckily, as you know, young people are better than, than, than my generation at understanding how to use technology. This has huge, huge impact on the future. You know, things that we cannot see and probably kids who are 12 or 14 already can sense. They cannot express it, but they can probably sense there's an opportunity there, there's an opportunity there. And same for the art world. You know, it's a, there all these discussions we've been having about online exhibitions. Uh, online exhibition will remain. There are pros, even, even for a gallery, I mean, I mean, I, I still remember when I was getting the dedicated tour, you know, there's an opening, the evening before they invite me to see the art first. Why? Because they think I'm influential. I can tell rich friends 
hey, go check this place. Uh, but now the art gallery can be online and reach millions of people, millions, you know, and of those millions, there's somebody who's buying the art. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's difficult for people like museums who exist based on physical presence. And when they go online, the question is, why do I have to go to the museum? Of course, you will tell me, well, it's not the same thing to see a painting on a screen and see it live. But for most people, it's actually not different. So, <clears throat> so changes will be colossal. And uh, you're younger than me, so you're probably better than me at understanding what the changes will be. I'm not sure about that, but um, it seems that there's a lot of uh, to do for artists uh, right right now in order to uh, to change the situation. Um, thank you very much for your for your time and very interesting conversation. So we try to uh, make these videos uh, as informal as possible in order to preserve the let's say the spirit of um, of life conversation. Uh, Anton will have some time in order to make montage, in order to make, make the video, and then we will send you the link that you can comment or, or say that I don't like this part, please delete it, or I would like to, to change this or that. So we, we will send you the link. Um, and thank you very much once again.